this offering in the name of our great God and Savior. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus Christ, Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, amen, hallelujah, mm -hmm. for the opportunity, Father God, hallelujah, to give to the most high, the creator of heaven and earth, who are we that he made us with the Lord and the angels, Father God. You clothed us, Father God, and put a roof over our head and put on our table, Jesus Christ. Lord, Father God, we give you back a thanks today, Jesus Christ. Take it, Lord Jesus, accept it, bless it, mm -hmm. multiply it, Lord yes, Jesus, Lord. Father God. And let your work on earth prosper mm -hmm. like in heaven. And let our bond be filled, Lord Jesus Christ, and your people to never beg nor mm -hmm. lie. And we ask these things in Jesus' in precious Jesus name. name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Jesus died upon the cross, and I know it was blood for me. Yeah, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross, and I know it was the blood for me. bunch of people. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen, amen. Oh, yeah, I know it was the blood for me. All right, praise God. Hallelujah. A little bit of piano player stuff in here this morning. All right. Glory to God. So uh, uh, you may be seated this morning. We're getting ready to, to bring our evangelist to the pulpit now, but I want to say this before he comes. You know, I just this morning when I when I was getting ready for church, I uh, I thought about Ben Franklin. And why was Ben Franklin important? Well, Ben Franklin was important because you know because of this country, and of course he's on the bill. But Ben Franklin uh, used to he built the University of Pennsylvania, and he wanted to. Um, it's an Ivy League university. And he wanted a guy named George Whitfield to be the president. George Whitfield turned him down. George Whitfield was a Brit of Brit. He was a preacher during the Great Awakening here in this country, which was between 1730 and 1750. Here in Jersey, Philadelphia, around this whole Northeast area. It was a great revival back then. But Ben Franklin used to, he, he, would, he would go see him preach. And he says, George Whitfield was so good at taking up offerings, that Ben Franklin would leave his what, wallet, his, what he called his purse, at home. That's the rumor. Don't be Ben Franklin. Bring it. You know, I say it again. Don't be Brent, Ben Franklin in the church. Bring Ben Franklin. All right. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. So we are blessed to have uh, uh, Brother Tim Green with us. He has a long history of evangelism. He's a Heading up evangelism over in St. Louis years ago, and uh, not too many, not, not as long as I remember. I remember many years back. Amen. And he's over here in the state, great state of New Jersey. And we are blessed to have him here. Yeah. We're grateful. Come on, we're going to preach our little church and lift this up and make this big. Amen. So I'm going to ask him to come, take his liberty, and preach the word of God this morning. Give him a good hand, praise. Welcome to the New Jersey. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is good to be in the house of God today. This first day of the week. And to celebrate the goodness of God. I enjoyed myself in his presence with my Lord and also with my brothers and sisters. So it's been a high privilege of mine today to meet all of you. I think I'm meeting all of you for the first time, and that is a high privilege of mine. Thank you for opening up your arms and allowing me to be here today. I do want to give honor to Pastor 
and uh, honor him as the man of God and the overseer of this church. And I want to uh, bring your attention to two portions of scripture. We'll read from Luke ch chapter 24, verse 45, and then we will also read from Matthew 28 and verse 20. These are from the Great Commission. And right before you stand, if you're standing, that's fine. But right before you stand, let me advertise for the table you saw in the foyer. Uh, my wife is not able to be with me at this trip, but she is a tremendous author. And I have brought several of her books with me. Not all of them, but several of them. And there's a book called The Awesome Power and Privilege of a Woman's Voice. We've sold over 8,000 copies of that. It's a bestseller among the organization. And it goes with a devotional, 23 chapters where women in the Bible use their voice properly, correctly, bless their life, bless their home, bless their generation. Be a great study for the ladies in particular. I've read it three times. I recommend it to the men as well. Amen. Also, there's a book called Clothed and In My Right Mind. And this is not dealing so much with our physical clothing, but how when we get up in the morning, we put on Christ. Amen. How we clothe our mind and clothe Amen. our spirit. There's a devotional that goes with that as well, and you get a bundle price with that. I think there's only two rest Bible studies that I have left. And these are only $12, but it teaches us the biblical plan of rest in the Bible. It's got a QR code on the back that you can actually go to YouTube, and my wife will actually teach you how to go through that Bible study. And a couple of posters. She's an artist, so she drew a Colossians 3 poster, and it's a picture of a dress that has all the things that God tells us we should put on. And so a lot of things at the table. And if you would meet me there after service, I'll try my best to get these great things in your hand and in your possession so you can put them in your heart. And we'll take Cash App, Venmo, credit cards, debit cards, uh, check if it's good, you know, <laughs> and uh, anything that we possibly can to make sure that you get this in your hand. So now reading from Luke chapter 24. If you'd like to stand with us, we do that as we respect the Word of God. Yeah. Luke 24, beginning at verse 45. Then opened Jesus their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. Yeah beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Anybody have the promise of the Father in your life? Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Verse 50. And Jesus led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were continuing the temple praising and blessing God. Now let's read from Matthew. This is Matthew's rendition of the same timetable, the Great Commission. And let's just read verse 20 as Matthew gives specifics of what Jesus said. Jesus said, teaching them... To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. I heard one old timer tell me that that's why he won't get in an airplane. Because the Bible said, lo, I'm with you always. <laughs> of course, that's not talking about height and depth and lo. It's, it's talking about listen up. <laughs> I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I want to preach, preach a message simply entitled, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. Those that study human behavior tell us this. That most individuals will only have two or three close friends in an entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. Two or three friends that you really say, they're my closest friends. That in a lifetime, 
most people will only have two or three. Now, I, I just happen to believe that if you're a part of the family of the living God, that statistic has to go way up. Because there's something like people of like precious faith that you just love and you're drawn close together. What a privilege to be part of the family of God. Friends. If I was to try to define what friends are, I, I, I would try to boil it down to this. Friends are someone who is always there for you. You might live long distance away or you might not even talk real often. But as soon as you're together or as soon as you're talking, it's like you've never been away. And you know at any time and at any moment, you can reach out and connect with your friend and they're going to be there for you. That's a friend. I reflect on the wedding vows that I shared with my wife. Luscious is the nickname I have for her. Her name is Lois. So you're welcome to call her Lois. I'll call her Luscious. But when we began to say our wedding vows, it was more than just a vows of lovers or husbands and wives. It's very much a vow of friendship. For we vow to each other that we're going to be with you and not leave you. Whether we're rich or not so rich. Poor. Whether we're healthy or sickness comes. We're not going to leave. We're not going to run off. We're going to be there in the good times and we'll be there in the bad times. And I will say that my wife is my best friend in this world. And I think that that is the way it should be, especially in the church of the living God with our marriages. Amen. I had a pastor teach on friendship one day and it, it never left my mind the way he paralleled friendship. He said, it's like a bus that is about to take a long journey and all the seats are full and there's suitcases under the seats and there's heavy winter overcoats and the bus is packed. And the bus releases the air brakes and they squeak and he closes the doors and he's about to leave the parking lot where they've all met for this long journey. And one person, you know, that one person that's always late, shows up breathlessly saying, wait for me, wait for me. And so they wait and they get their things together. And now this last individual steps up the steps of the boat and looks down the aisle, but it's full. The bus is full. And under this arm is an overcoat. And in this hand is a suitcase. In this arm is a kitty cat. Oh. Anybody like kittens? And there is, they taste pretty good, don't they, Pastor? I, I, like, I like cats. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend anybody there. <laughs> so they're looking for a seat. But every seat is full but a friend. From the back of the bus where there's really not move, it's like, hey, friend, come, come sit back with me. And so you go back and sit with your friend where there's really not room. And so on the entire journey, you're kind of crowded by your friend. And their cat is licking your cheek with sandpaper tongue and shedding on your clothes. And you don't mind too much because it's your friend. And their luggage is banging your knee when you turn the corners. And you don't mind too much because it's a friend. All of our friends come with baggage. They all have baggage. But we keep them in, st in spite of their baggage because they're our friends. In fact, oftentimes we give them nicknames that speak about their baggage. <laughs> How are you today, Grumpy? moody, whatever it might be. And we love them anyways and choose to be their friends because we have friendship. When I think about God wanting to be my friend, I am absolutely blown away that he would be called my friend. Now, in this relationship with him, he makes me look good. I'm so thankful that I have a friend in Jesus. But if I were honest with you today, I'm not so sure I make him look good. Because my baggage isn't holy like he is. 
And I'm not almighty like he is and all knowing like he is and all loving like he is and full of grace and mercy like he is. So somehow in this relationship of God that I have as he's my friend, sometimes I feel like it's so one-sided friendship. There was a president several years back now, Columbia Seminary and Bible College. And at the time, this was the number one college and university for sending out missionaries into foreign fields. And he is standing before his board of directors and he is reading a resignation letter. And he's telling them that I must resign. And the ministry that has produced more missionaries from this university than any other university, I must leave this ministry. And also the friends that I have been with, I must leave. And then he tells them why. Most of them already knew, but his wife had a terrible disease called Alzheimer. And she was getting to a place that she had to be put into some type of nursing home to be taken care of. And so he began to say that I will have to resign here so that I can spend time with her. After his speech with tears in everyone's eyes, they began to plead with him and said, please, you cannot resign. Please think again your choice for these two reasons. First of all, look how effective you have been as the president and the entire world is being affected by missionaries because of you. And then secondly, this is not going to be easy for you to hear. But the disease that your wife has will progress until she won't even know who you are. And the time that you spend with her will be wasted. When he responds to their request, he says, I understand what you're saying. But these are the exact two reasons why I must resign. Because no ministry is built on one individual but the team that God has put me here will continue to produce missionaries and you will grow and move in the next season. And then he said, you're right on the second account because before I came here, I went by the nursing home to visit my wife. I walked into the room and I said, honey, I'm here. And she looked and saw me, but there was no look of recognition. I could have been a stranger or any nurse that was in the place. Broken hearted, I sat down on the bed where she was sitting and gently caressed her hair and kissed gently her cheek and said, baby, I miss you so much. It's so good to be with you and to see you. Again, she let me love on her, but she did not know that I was her husband. She did not know I was her lifelong lover. It was almost like she never knew me. He said, that's beginning to come to pass, and she might never know me again. But that's not the fullness of our relationship. He said, I still know who she is. She has been my wife and given me children. She's been my constant companion for these many years. She has been my ministry inspiration. And she has been my close friend. And if she never again knows who I am, I will not leave her in this time because she's my friend and I will always be with her. Oh, that's friendship. That's friendship. I think sometimes in my relationship with God, for whatever reason, the callousness or the struggles of the season I'm in, sometimes I don't even know if God is there. Sometimes I worship and it feels like the words come out of my mouth and fall to the ground. My prayers don't seem to have any effect. But this I know, like Job declares, I might not be able to find him on the left hand or the right, but he knows the way that I take. And I have this confidence, even when I'm not a good friend, and even when I I'm not sure about him. He still knows who I am. And he calls me friend. And he will never leave me. Nor forsake me. What a friend we have in Jesus. This is a true story about Joseph Scriven. Who was born to wealthy parents in Dublin, Ireland. 
His parents lived for the social life. And every weekend they threw extravagant parties, involved themselves in immoral lifestyles. Joseph Scriven was 25 and realized how, how useless and wasteless this was of his life. So he began to search for the meaning of life. He found himself walking one Sunday by a small church, boards that were a little dilapidated and paint that was peeling off, but he could hear beautiful sound coming through the doors. It drew his interest, and so he opened the doors and sat on the last pew. There he heard a beautiful choir singing about Jesus. What a good God he is. And he would never leave and never forsake us. That day, Joseph Scriven went down to the altar and gave his life to God. That means a whole lot more than what it really means in our world today. He gave his life to Jesus and began a total different life. His parents did not like the difference in him. He was no longer drinking and imbuing alcohol. He was no longer a part of the lifestyle of immorality. He had found a friend in Jesus. They were embarrassed and basically convicted by his actions. So they began to tell him, you cannot go to church. He said, I can go nowhere else and find life. I must go to church. They threatened him, if you go one more time, we will cut you out of our will. We will tell our friends that we no longer have a son named Joseph. He continued to go to church. They were true to their word. They began to tell their friends they don't have a son. They never had a son. They took him out of the wheel and he began to gravitate toward his church family. And there he found mothers, brothers, sisters, fathers and mothers in the family of God. Are you thankful for the family of God? It wasn't long until Joseph Scriven fell in love with a young lady, probably one of the first voices he heard when he came in the church. And there, a quick courtship and a marriage was due to happen. In fact, the night before their wedding day, she mysteriously fell into a nearby river and drowned, was gone. And Joseph Scriven has lost his earthly mother and father, and now his beloved that he had planned on spending a lifetime with was taken from him. And so with ache in his heart, he began to travel to try to find a new place to start over. He found himself in a province of Canada, and there he just joined himself to the outskirts of the community. They would say of Joseph that he was really strange, for he would cross the street, take a coat off his back, and put it on the shoulders of a total stranger who was shivering. You can find Joseph Scriven out harvesting the fields, but not for money, but for the farmer who was down in his back. You would find him chopping wood for the widow, but not for surviving just to be a blessing. He had turned himself in to living for Jesus and for Jesus being his friend until that's all he lived for. Town thought him crazy and strange. Somehow his family found him and sent him telegram. And the words simply said from his mother, I'm sick and dying. Please forgive me. He had no money to take a ship back to Ireland. He had no way to get back, but he did sit down. And it's not clear whether the telegram ever got back to his mama, but he wrote a little bit of poetry for her. And this is what he wrote. Mom, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. When he thought about reaching out to his mama who is asking for forgiveness, he doesn't take time to say, this is where I've been. That is what I've done. He said, mama, if you've only got a few breaths yet to live, let me tell you what.
what is the most important thing. And he writes another line as he declares, if you've trials and temptations, is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can you find a friend so faithful who will all your sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Not sure if this was ever sent to his mother because already he had begun to succumb to pneumonia and it wasn't long until Joseph Scriven passed away. After a few days of not seeing him around town, they discovered him in that shack where he used to live and here was this poetry beside his bed addressed to his mother with the telegram there also beside the bed. And a little insight began to happen. It was still years later until Charles Converse put music to this poem. And we have the powerful hymn that some of us even sing today. And most of us knew from our past. Are you weak and heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, steal our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. What we have to understand is this. Is that when Jesus is walking with the disciples, he is exemplifying and giving us the examples of the relationship that he will have with us that will never walk with him in the flesh. Born 2,000 years later, in this generation we live, but he desperately wants us to know he was a friend to them, and he is a friend to us. They walked together. They talked together. They ate together. They shared the word together. They had great fellowship as friends. He told them, and this is what I've defined as friendship. He told them over and over, others will leave you. I will not leave you. Right. Earthly brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers will leave you. I will not leave you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. And that's what they believed. Mm -hmm. But then, that last supper happened. Jesus took Peter, James, and John to that special place on the Mount of Olives where he prayed often. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, agony. So much as he prayed, the disciples had to close their eyes in sorrow. They weren't sleeping. They closed their eyes because they were so depressed at what they saw, they wanted to close out the world. And then the soldiers come from the temple and arrested him. This had to be confusing to the disciples because this is their friend. He declared he will never leave them. Right. He would never forsake them. Right. Some followed from afar. Simon Peter, the young man, and John himself. In the trial, John is inside watching it happen. Simon Peter is led in by John and warms his hair in the outer court. And they hear the terrible cries of the crowd as they say, crucify him, talking about their friend that had done no wrong. It must have been heartbreaking to watch him being beaten, forced to carry that cross member outside the city of Jerusalem to a skull-shaped hill called Golgotha, and there crucifixion happened to Jesus. It must have been terrible for Jesus' friends, the disciples, to watch this. In fact, so few of them are there. And finally, after tremendous pain and torture, it is finished, he cries, and he gives up the ghost. And they take his dead body from the cross and put it in a borrowed tomb. How final that separation must have felt. No doubt all of them had experienced death of some family member or something in their life. And now they know the way that death is. 
is that it is final. But he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's a friend that never leaves and never forsakes. So it is friendship along with others. But it is friendship relationship that three days later causes the stone to be moved away. And triumphant over death, hell, and the grave, their friend Jesus has resurrected, shows himself to the disciples on the road, shows himself to Mary and the other Mary, shows himself to Peter and John, shows up in that room when the doors are shut and declares, touch my hands that were hurt for you, touch my side that was driven for you because his promise is I will never leave you nor forsake you and death itself cannot keep my friendship from you. After the resurrection, the Bible says that he showed himself alive after many infallible proofs to the disciples. And they spend time in fellowship again, eating, talking, walking. But in the text we read, these are the last words he speaks to them. They're walking and they're walking and they're walking. It's almost like you see a lingering that he knows he's got to ascend up into heaven, but he's staying just one more moment. Have you been on, on the telephone with a certain special one and you know it's getting late, you got to get off the phone, and you're like, oh, it's been so good talking to you. Well, I guess it's about time. But then one more word is mentioned and you go on another 30 minutes talking. It's almost like that lingering with someone that you care. You're at that door kissing goodnight to a special beloved. And then even though it's time to go, not get up for work in a few hours, you just want to stay just a little longer. Talk just. It's like that, as the Bible says, that he began to speak with them and they were walking and they were talking and the scripture said, whoa, they looked up and they were all the way to Bethany. Right. That's about a four mile walk from Jerusalem. Oh and he's finally like, well, we, we, we can't linger anymore. <laughs> and so he opened their understanding yeah. and began to explain to them that I had to die so that repentance can happen for everyone. And I had to be buried so that through my burial, baptism can happen. You know the story of the death, burial, and resurrection. And I had to resurrect again so that you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the promise of my Father. So what I want you to do is go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. Now, one dimension of the promise is this. I'll never leave you, never forsake you. But even as he's saying that, he's lifted up from the earth and he begins to ascend up into heaven. And they are sitting there watching. It's, it's like when you went to grandma's house and you said goodbye and you got in the station wagon and you're driving down the road and you keep waving out the door and grandma and grandpa on the front porch until nothing can be seen anymore. It's like you're still waving and still looking for Jesus as you ascend the clouds until finally angels are standing by and say, did you not hear his promise? He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Go to Jerusalem and wait for that promise to come to pass. So they went to Jerusalem. Those of you know, this is where Acts picks up the actions of the apostles. Acts chapter 1. Chapter 2, they're all in one place in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mud rushing mighty wind. Do you realize what happened was that he came into that room like he had shown himself just a few days before. And they felt his presence. I believe they expected to turn around and see him. They knew what his presence felt like. They knew what the presence of his friend felt like. They felt it. They knew it. And they expected to see him. But he wasn't here in a physical form this time. Yeah. His spirit was there. Yeah. And as they reached out to their friend. Yeah. Where are you at, friend? He filled them with his spirit. And now he doesn't walk beside them. He walks in them. He doesn't live next door. 
He lives in them. There's no friend like our friend Jesus because no one can be that close like he can be. This powerful promise he declared is so strong even for us. And we know when we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that's the closest that we can be to our friend Jesus is when he lives in our heart. But this is so powerful even beyond that. Because if you have the privilege to live a ripe old age and let's say at 150 years of age, you're on your deathbed. I'm not even sure people want to live that long. I don't think I do. But 150 years of age and you're able to tell all your close friends goodbye and you know, how much you have meant to me on this world and all the things and then you breathe your last breath your hand will fall lifeless to the cot and your spirit will leave your body. And honestly, all of your earthly friends, you'll leave. But if you have the Holy Ghost, same scenario, breathe your last breath, lifeless hand to the cot. And when you leave this body, the Holy Ghost that has been in you and you've been worshiping and praising him and walking with him and talking with him. You have this promise that he will not leave you then. And the same presence of God that you enjoy in church services and in your personal devotion will go with you when you cross Jordan's rolling tide. And whatever that time is of rest and peace before the end of the world, you won't be experiencing that alone. But the same God that you love and worship will be there with you. And when the end of time comes, that's what the Bible says. To be absent is to be present with the Lord. And when the end of time comes, and all men, the Bible says, great and small, will stand before that judge. And men will be fearful and doubtful. But you won't have to stand there alone because the same Holy Ghost that gave you strength through things of this life will be there with you experiencing that. And when the great judge looks at you and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you look at that gate made of a single pearl that swings open in heaven pavement is upon your feet as pure gold and you know there's a mansion down the road whatever all that means you won't experience it alone Amen. Thank you, for the same Holy Ghost it is in this place that we feel the same worship that invites his presence to be upon us will be with us through whatever the next life, the real life is. In fact, this is exactly what Matthew 28 and 20 says. When Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. For the word end here is a Greek word that speaks of completion and finality. And the word world is the Greek word eon, which speaks of time or eternity. So literally his promise to us is this. Lo, I am with you always, even to the completion of all eternity. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will be with you always. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All oh, our sins increase to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not take it to our friend. Carry everything to God in prayer. What a friend in Jesus. Would you stand with me today? I don't ever want to assume. I believe that most people in the place today have gone down to an altar of repentance. Most have been baptized, calling on the name of Jesus, if not all. Most here have lifted worship 
with open hearts and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence of speaking in other tongues. But I think God wants to know, wants us to know afresh that even with the Holy Ghost in us, He'll still never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll be with you to the end. I, I don't know how much Pastor knows about the ministry and the giftings and the callings that God has called me to. But I, I see some things in the Holy Ghost right now that I'd like to just I'd like to just share. Hey, my sister, your eyes are closed, but you're sitting on the back there. Can someone touch her and let her know I'm speaking to her? What's her name? Yes, I'm speaking to you. You can stand there. But this is what I see in the Holy Ghost. I know you're going through a journey of rejection right now, a battle. And there are some people that are close to you that are, it's, it's breaking your heart. Are the dreams that are seemingly shattered around your feet. And you are needy today. Where all this rejection is upon you, you are needy to know he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll be with you to the end of the world. And he has peace for you in the midst of this storm. He has joy for you in the midst of this trial. And if you will let him have where you're at, be vulnerable to him, my sister. And let him say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with and I need a friend. Yes. You're going to feel nail start ends around you today, sis. And you're going to know you've got fresh help. With the yeah. Yeah. Hey, ha -ha. Can I speak to you, man of God? What's your first name? E. E. You told me that. I forgot Forgive me for forgetting. Brother Eve, I see a calling upon your life. But a little frustration in your calling and your ministry because you're expecting it to blossom more, to find what you might call more effectiveness. And so you're frustrated with God. Open the door and God do this. In your ministry, Brother Eve, God will never leave you. With your anointing, God will never forsake you. The gifts of calling to God without repentance. And if you get a fresh hunger, use me, oh God, in whatever way. Your friend's going to direct you. I see a threshold that you're about to cross and help anointing coming fresh to you again. The frustration you've been upon has helped direct you. So open your heart to receive a newness of your ministry, a new passion, a new calling, a new freshness in Jesus. In Jesus' name. Hey. Hey, Mama, can I speak to you? Would you come here? My mom was there. My, my mom was like a, a, a busy bee. And at her funeral, I, I told this story that Mom is a busy bee. But I related to the story of Samson. And she builds honey. People that are sick, dying. And it's for others to take. I, I feel like there's such value. And you don't often get told of how much you're appreciated. Because those you give the most for are those that somehow can't give back to you. Words or help. But I think your friend wants to lift you up today. Tell you how powerful you are. Let me speak to you. I see a tremendous burden you have for some unsaved loved ones. And some voices you keep lifting up in intercession, God. You told me. You told me, my family. You told me, my family. If you'll speak their voices again, if you'll speak their names again, your voice is going up to heaven now. I see angels involving themselves in revival. I see angels begin to move in your hand. Let repentance come again to these loved ones and let the intercessory prayer. I believe. I believe. This is what we know, sis. Is that our friend loves these loved ones more than we do. And if we would bend over backwards and do everything we possibly can.
king. Don't you know our heavenly father is not going to let your prayers somehow fall. He's not going to let the things that have been planted in their heart through the years not have effect. But that will not be forgotten. Thank you, Father. For that. I, I feel the closeness of our friend in the place today. Would, would, you, would you just like that all of us just get in this open area right here and let's come together as brothers and sisters in the family of God. Let's understand that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in this world and nothing in the world to come. If we have that experience of His Holy Ghost in our heart, we have a friend that will never leave throughout all eternity. He will be with us in Jesus' name. To get close to a brother or sister, thank you for doing that. Put a hand on somebody, your family, that's beautiful. God's giving me words for some of you. I'm going to get out of the microphone and just pray for some of you. Ministry, if you want to help us, whatever you feel to do, there is a friendship of God that He is not only wanting us to know we can count Him as a friend, but He wants to be our friend. Jesus made this statement. Jesus made this statement. When He opened their understanding in Luke 24, He said this. He said, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to die. That word behoove means it was good for Jesus to suffer and die. Why? So the repentance, remission of sins, baptism is name. But that's that's good for me. But he said it was good for him. So you've got to see the way he looks at this. Is that if he gets the opportunity for you repent of your sins, to be baptized in His name, and to receive the infill of the Holy Ghost. It's good for Him to go to the cross and die and be buried and resurrect because that gives Him the opportunity to live in you. What a friend we have in Jesus that He said it's good for me to hurt to suffer, to die, to take on the sins of this world because that gives me opportunity. Never leave you. Never forsake you. We're going to begin to sing and worship. The ministry is going to pray. Would you lift up your hands one more time? If there's an intercessor in the place, would you just begin to pray that everybody in the place will receive the Holy Ghost? Speak in tongues and kin. Let the freshness of the Spirit of God be upon you. Would you lift your voice, intercessor? In Jesus' name.
seems the fewer friends you have. Come on. Some friends come and go. Some go to their reward. So many times you will be left feeling alone, depressed, unworthy, unlovable, unreachable. Jesus is always there. In the times of our deepest grief, our deepest sorrow, and sometimes nothing can stop those emotions from happening. No. They just happen. Yes. We know that Jesus is with us. Amen. Close our eyes and realize, Lord, I know you're with me right now. Even though it's a hard for me to feel anything but this emotion I'm feeling right now. As long as that quiet voice will speak to you and tell you, it's going to be okay. I'm with you. I'm not leaving. I'm not going. There have been times, I remember years ago, if you've ever driven through the Lincoln or the Holland Tunnel on the way into New York or out of New York, um, I don't know if you're like me, I get a little nervous sometimes when I go down in that tunnel. I hope it's not going to be, I'm not going to have to be there for long. pump fresh air in it, but it still smells like exhaust fumes. And there was one time I went down, there was a terrible, terrible traffic back up, and we were stuck in the tunnel for, oh my goodness, an hour. I don't remember who I was with or whether I was alone, but I just remember feeling a little bit of the panic coming over me to be stuck down there. And, uh, that's what it can, you know, after a while, we saw the traffic start to move an inch forward. And eventually we made our way slowly and traffic picked up and got a little faster. And then what a glorious thing was it was to see the end of that tunnel come out into the sunlight again. Yes. Sometimes it feels like you're in the midst of that tunnel and there's a traffic jam. Panic, fear, loneliness, desperation even comes upon you. But you got to remember, Jesus is going to bring you to the light again. Amen. Thank you. There is light yes. at the end of the tunnel. Amen. And his name is Jesus. Curiously, a good many people who have had what they call near-death experiences have described that the moment they pass, they go through a tunnel toward a light. Hallelujah. And those who walk with the Lord, they get to the end of that light and they see their Savior ready to welcome them. Hallelujah. So much, such a powerful thing upon them, they don't want to come back. God sometimes he sends them back. They have to live their lives. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. You know, we could do a lot of self-examination in our lives and say all the things that we've done wrong or haven't done and all the times we've failed in our promises to each other, maybe sometimes even to God. And we wonder to ourselves, does Jesus still want me around? I have to say that he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he 
his forgiveness is as big as his heart and his love for us. So we continue to press forth to the promise, the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Green, we appreciate so much what you brought to us today. So wonderful the church to be in this place, you know, to be with each other. So let us go forth from this today and make a friend and be a friend to someone who needs the Lord. A purpose in our hearts that we're going to do that. Father, we thank you for bringing us in this place today. We thank you for being here in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we thank you for the word that came forth from the brother who was sent from you to give it to us today, O oh God. We ask right now for traveling mercies to send us back to our homes and abodes in safety and harmony. Send angels to watch over us and bless us to bring us again together to worship you in spirit and in truth should you tarry. But Lord, if you come, come quickly, take us with you. We give you praise and we give you glory and we magnify your name. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give him a hand praise this morning. You are dismissed in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you as you go.